So, the second finalist is Cryptomice. And we need the team captain of Cryptomice to come up, to run up here to the front. Team captain. Team captain gets a headset, because um, otherwise... And can we just quickly have the team getting up so that uh, we see where the support is? Great. Um, I assume we were a couple or more during the weekend for, for, for the job at hand, uh, but uh, as we said, it is a Monday and uh, we know that quite a number of the teams are decimated simply because they really needed to get back to work because their main work was done in the 48 hours of coding and co-creating here in the auto world in Brussels. I think uh, I, I said something different before, but it's the auto world. Now, the gentleman is ready to rock and roll. Cryptomice is represented by Thomas. Thomas. And Thomas's Woo! microphone is working. Thomas, Perfect. in a second, we'll see 10 minutes coming yeah. up. You have 10 minutes from now. Take it. All right. So basically, the problem we want to solve is that cloning objects in the real world may be something that is difficult today, it's going to be easy tomorrow. So the point is, uh, we want to solve this problem outside the physical world. And to do so, we introduce the concept of the virtual twin, which is basically the cryptographical identity of, uh, the, digit of the, uh, the physical good. And uh, we build a protocol on this, and it work it's, uh, looks very simple, like you will not accept the physical good if I cannot give to you the virtual good. So basically, let's go far away in the future and say that everyone agrees on this protocol. And I am uh, some uh, rogue and I try to break into the customs and steal some of the physical goods. And now I cannot sell them because the people will not accept them. So we have removed the economic incentive from actually producing fakes or stealing or whatever. Um, so basically, this is the ideal world, and in the real world, we also have to understand how to enforce this, uh, uh, like in the, in the everyday life, because not everyone understands that that is a Nash equilibrium. And, uh, so uh, this uh, virtual token will change ownership from the, the uh, IP owner down to the, product, to the producer, down to the transport company, down to another transport company, all, all this chain of holders. So basically, uh, let's say then a chain of holders, then um, so one of these uh, entities steal the, the, steal the product. Downstream, someone will signal that something is broken on this uh, uh, chain of ownership. And it starts like drawing a red line uh, through these owners. Uh, since the player is a rogue, he will do it maybe again. So there will be for another product, another red line, like crossing exactly on the point uh, where the rogue player is. Uh, you can think of this at a uh, business entity level, but this can even go down to employee level. So you could have addresses uh, tracking exactly which people are touching the goods. Uh, so the question now is, uh, what is the incentive to pressing the button and signal that something is wrong on the, uh, this chain of ownership? Let's say that you don't do it and someone else down the stream does it, then you will start having red lines crossing through you. And the, the number of red lines going through you is a clear indicator that someone at the customs should check what you do, or a logistic operator should check uh, very carefully why, why are all these reds coming on for you. Uh, then, as a protocol, we also wanted to help uh, with the big volumes problem. So basically, there's a cargo with um, thousands of objects inside, and today, the ID of the cargo is completely unrelated from the ID of the products inside, from its composition, from anything. So what we envisioned is that the ID of the cargo, of the shipment, is a, a function of the IDs of the products. And if we agree on the function, I don't need to give access to you to my database. Uh, we don't need to like, share connection or maybe give access to data I shouldn't give access you to. We just agree on the function and without uh, any database uh, trick, we can prove that a, a product is exactly inside the uh, idea of the shipment. Uh, okay, so this is just some example of how we envisioned some of the apps that can be built on top of, the, uh, on top of this protocol. 
Uh, during the hackathon, we built, uh, uh, realized a smart contract on Ethereum because it was easy, but uh, as a protocol, we want to be technology agnostic. So this can be done on Bitcoin, it can be done uh, on Hyperledger, on what, you know, anything that has enough uh, cryptographical security to, to do, then, then it will be okay. Uh, Cross-chain swaps are on the building, so it may work. So, yeah. so basically the point is uh, the producer is the only one who can create the virtual the objects. So if Prada says I want 100 bags and the producer will build uh, maybe 200 bags, then he will only have 100 virtual twins. And there is no way he can clone them because it's a, such a hard cryptographical problem to uh, break these keys that it doesn't, e it doesn't even make sense. So, you know, that is the, the point we're going to. Uh, another interesting thing is that before accepting the physical good, you have to check that the virtual one is, uh, can, uh, can come to you. So you can pre-approve shipments before the actual uh, goods come. So uh, if I have 100 uh, goods to send to you, at first I give to you the, uh, the ownership of the virtual ones, uh, and then or, or maybe I, can, I show you that I have for real have the ownership of the virtual ones, and only then I ship them to you for real. And the point is that we want to move up, as upstream as possible the, the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the detection uh, of possible uh, problems. Um, so basically you see maybe an interface where the current uh, virtual holder is uh, Prada, the pre-approved holder is FedEx, so uh, FedEx is sure that the goods coming in are exactly the ones which has been uh, signed by the, uh, the producer. Uh, the custom, now I cannot click, but uh, in the custom you can also expand uh, this uh, interface and see what are the usual carrier for that good. So you can see uh, in also in advance if something is strange, uh, maybe, you know, the, the shipment, uh, there, were, there was two, some storm and uh, flight carriers could not depart uh, and it goes maritime uh, overseas. But maybe, you know, that's a warning point. So the, the point is uh, finding fakes uh, into the custom is like try to look for a, a needle into a haystack. So the, we want to give tools to help this process. Uh, and the most interesting part is probably that we are an open source protocol, so we uh, leveraged our mentors and we created uh, our first protocol contributors. Uh, for instance, uh, Locke came out uh, with the idea of the virtual twin and also the first, uh, also this uh, shipment matching uh, idea where we work it together. And our prototype is integrated with the GS1, uh, uh, with the GS1 standard. Uh, then uh, we have uh, some people which really helped us to review all the process. Uh, and also I would like to make a special mention to the two young lawyers over there, because uh, for me it was so strange that uh, by law, if I, pos if I have this in my hand, this is my possession. I could have stolen like two seconds ago, I have it in my hand, it's my possession. And to, uh, in Europe it's like this, and to me it was like so strange. And now basically with this virtual twin, I say, I, I can have this in my hand, but if I cannot prove that I also have the cryptographical keys of my virtual twin, this like changes the concept of ownership. Or, you know, this was very interesting. Uh, also, um, yes, yeah, so also, you know, protecting the privacy of the, of the, the public is somehow important because these addresses uh, can part of your sensitive data so uh, as, a as, a open, as a foundation, the foundation which will handle the, the open source platform, we will uh, prepare a buffer uh, which will be the link between the addresses and the real identities. Uh, maybe in the first period we will handle this buffer uh, because some, someone could say, I want to be forgotten, so you must delete this link. You, you cannot put it on the blockchain directly because uh, uh, you know, in the blockchain, it's for real immutable, so uh, you cannot delete it. Um, but the, the point is to have this uh, type of uh, identity buffer distributed across countries so that every country will be responsible of handling its, its own citizens. And with two minutes of advance, I think uh, the, I made a complete overview of it. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thomas, for yeah. taking us along the virtual twin supply chain 
solution that you have presented. Uh, and now, of course, uh, same procedure as before. We'd like to invite uh, the members uh, of the grand jury to come back up on stage to put their questions to Thomas. And after that, we'll be involving you, ladies and gentlemen. So, gentlemen, come up back on stage with a big applause. Vinay, Paolo, Charles, and of course, Christian. Vinay? Yeah. Thank you. And maybe uh, last time Charles took it away, maybe Vinay um, would like to start. Thank you. So uh, I really like this whole virtual twin concept. Um, um, so many different directions to go. So uh, virtual twins embedded in a virtual world. Mm -hmm. You know, all your kind of production information, carbon emissions, uh, you know, point of origin, human rights conditions under which things were generated, all the way through to end of life disposal. Uh, it seems like it's kind of the stepping stone to building almost like a simulator of the world, right? You have mm -hmm. a simulator for the objects, you have a simulator for the law, you have a simulator for the natural conditions. Um, could you say a little more about I mean, really, the kind of underlying philosophy, like why this particular model, you know, and, and what does the virtual twin really mean for consumers? Like, how do I use these virtual twins in addition to all this track and trace stuff? If I have a library of yeah. all of these virtual objects yeah. sitting on my phone, what can I do with them? So the assumption we use is that maybe the consumers will uh, care about the product being real, maybe not. But uh, uh, so the point is get the fakes upstream because maybe you can trust the consumer, maybe not. But for some goods, it makes a lot of sense. So let's say you have a, a Rolex watch and uh, when you want to uh, send him to maintenance, an uh, interesting thing, out of 10 Rolex watches, like six or seven in maintenance are fake. So before accepting something in maintenance, you may want to show that you really have its virtual, uh, uh, the virtual one. Uh, same goes for warranties, you know, you, uh, since when you take owner, ownership of, the, of this uh, virtual uh, object, then your warranty starts and you can have a time lock uh, and it expires after a while. So there are uh, also use cases for the consumers, uh, but uh, I think we were stressing out a little bit more the other, uh, the chain, because the consumer may or may not be incentivized to look for the real one. Yeah. And the, obvious, the obvious thing is... The obvious thing is insurance, right? Yeah. yeah if you have yeah, a, if you have a set yeah. of these objects, you can prove yeah. that you have custody of them. You could take yeah. it automatically to an insurer. Yeah, I think there's I think there's a lot of mileage in this. I think it's a really good idea. I'm uh, very interested in how this would work if I have a thousand units. Pick your number: ten thousand, one hundred thousand mm -hmm. units showing mm -hmm. up at my factory or my warehouse door. Mm -hmm. How am I going to connect that individual unit to the virtual twin that you've created? How is that going to pass to me, and how am I going to connected to the actual physical unit. Take, Definitely. for instance, sunglasses, heavily counterfeited. Mm -hmm. uh, no uh, place really to put uh, any uh, very easily uh, accessible barcode or anything like that on it. How, how would that, in your conception, how would that pass? So well, as a protocol, we, just, we don't want to go into the implementation, but uh, we have prepared uh, some examples. Uh, the easiest way is matching the serial IDs. This is like the easy, the, the today's solution would actually be uh, the, um, this, uh, this serial ID. But uh, you can also make some, uh, like take pictures of the object from all the possible direction, hash them, and that becomes another in information of the virtual twin. Or maybe you can, uh, for a very expensive object, you can make a cryptographic, uh, no sorry, a tomographic uh, scan with X-rays of it and, and hash it and put that as another part of the virtual uh, uh, twin. So uh, we don't have all the answer. I mean, as a protocol, we want to involve everyone to provide the best solution. Image recognition can be very nice. So you can have images from all the possible uh, angles. And then you hash it, and you can just see if it matches them. For cheap goods, it could work. So there are many ways to tackle this problem. We integrated the GS1 protocol because it's what's like out there today. So it, it makes sense today, but there are many ways to tackle this no, It's not, karaoke not time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's actually you have to present me or to introduce me in my question. <laughs> so, I mean, come on. <laughs> so, Thomas, 
Congratulations as well to you uh, yeah, for you. bringing yeah. CryptoMice to uh, the stage of uh, a finalist. My question to you is relatively simple. In your example, when you held your phone on your hand mm -hmm. and you were saying that you may have stolen it, imagine you didn't, you just paid it to the other person. Mm -hmm. So you just bought it. How do you synchronize, how would you synchronize the transfer of property that just happened physically into your uh, blockchain, into your uh, virtual ownership? Okay. Uh, so. It for the like um, for this chain which is before the consumer that will be s some integration done with the you know their own uh, they already have logistic system of course so we don't let's focus on the consumer for this uh, answer uh, usually consumers don't really want to download another app uh, it doesn't really they relate to the brand directly so it's going to be in charge of the brand so imagine like prada they spend so many so much money on marketing they really have, have incentive to educate their consumers to ask uh, when they go to the shop for the virtual version of it. So maybe inside uh, their, uh, their own system, in their own CRM system of the, of the brand, uh, they will actually have this, uh, they will introduce in the consumer journey this step where you receive the virtual twin. Now, how you do it, it can be, the way I see it, it's probably embedded in, inside the brand apps. So it's going to be an experience for the user inside the, the brand app not inside another app, because that will be puzzling. But uh, yeah, that's a step, uh, you know, if you want to educate a com community to work with a protocol, there will be an educational step. So uh, yeah, that's going to be an effort that uh, someone will have to do. So yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, maybe a similar question to the one I asked uh, the other team. Um, how do you promote the use of your protocol? I mean, what, what sort of actions would you take to, in concrete terms to make sure that there is sufficient uptake so mm -hmm. that this becomes a standard? So the, before coming here, we uh, tried to, to probe a little bit this idea with some luxury brands. And uh, for them, it's so important to be sure that only 100 of their products are produced, that uh, they will are like very interested in uh, adopting this technology and enforcing its use across their line of production and transportation. So starting from a niche market, it's probably the first step we will need to go. Uh, coming here, we also, like not discovered, but uh, it was very clear that also pharmaceutical companies have very similar problems. So the final consumer wants to be very sure he's getting the real product. So there are use cases where this need, uh, where the, uh, every, the alignment of the brand and the alignment of the consumer is the same. In these scenarios is where we would try to plug in the protocol at first. Uh, how to scale, uh, to how to arrive to the, to the vision in 50 years where everyone adopts it, it's, a, it's like a, another, another point. Uh, where, when I was listening to, to, to Bia's presentation, I really thought like, uh, this can solve the problem like today, and, uh, but you know, the vision uh, should be a little bit uh, uh, it's, it's an interesting trade-off for, uh, for you, a jury, to decide uh, w w do I want to solve the problem today or, or tomorrow? It's, it's interesting, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> have three and a half minutes uh, to go. Any more burning questions uh, on the part of the grand jury? And uh, Vinay, it's always good for a question. So, um, well, let's talk a little bit about... Um, sort of footprint, right? Mm -hmm. So we're basically talking about having a, a sort of mirror image uh, of every object of value in the world. Sounds like it's going to turn into a lot of data, mm -hmm. right? Um, do you have any thoughts on the kind of long-term maintenance of those structures? Like if there's going to be a platform which is basically storing, um, you know, uh, I don't know, tens of megabytes of individual uh, data per consumer on this kind of massive scale, in the long run, I mean, do you envisage all of that being resident on chain? Do you think of this as being something that's going to break into silos? Who's going to pay for the maintenance of the data structures for this kind of enormous uh, thing? And also, um, how do we verify that the virtual twins, when they're created, contain accurate data? So I, I suggest that this virtual twin is, you know, 25 kilograms of carbon per object, actually the real number is 75. How do we make sure that the virtual representation of the object is accurate at the point where it's created? You know, once it's in the cryptographic system, it's secure. What do we do about the kind of first mile problem 
um, you know, how, how do we capture that and who pays for the platform? Mm -hmm. So, well, um, I will replay first to the second question. So let's say that you are a producer. We grant to you one of these uh, cryptographic keys by which you can mint your new tokens. And you declaring uh, some uh, forever, you are declaring fake data about your products. So you will have uh, sooner or later, there will be a lot of red lines coming into you. And maybe they will cross before, but at the end, it will be very strange that, uh, you know, they will all point to you all the time. So, uh, in the re of course, if you want to declare fake data forever, you can do it. Uh, I can uh, use, an, use, I don't know, open timestamp and uh, declare forever something wrong, and now it's wrong. Uh, but the point is, this, this chain of ownership is immutable, uh, and it will point to you. So, uh, that's the point. Uh, uh, how? maintain all these infrastructure operative well um, you know there are a couple of chains which really needs uh, some economic value to plug be to plug it in, plug it into them and this is at eight uh, 800 billion pro problem in europe the, in the opening day the, you said that uh, the counterfeit problem in europe is uh, like i don't remember if 80 or 800 billions oh, all right sorry 340 billion so uh, it the, the pays for a lot of space, so yeah. <laughs> a quick question to follow up on Vinay. Uh, sorry, who will have access to the data? Uh, you say you're using an open source protocol. Would it also be permit, you will permit permission bases? Because, um, you know, if, if I, I don't necessarily want to expose to the world how much of any particular inventory I have uh, based on uh, the blockchain. So uh, maybe it was not very clear in the presentation. So the addresses on the, on the blockchain will be public, but the knowledge of, of who owns that addresses uh, is, not on the, is gonna be handled initially by the foundation and then by probably countries, uh, I don't know. Um, and another point that we didn't put on the slide is that we ca you can use to hide some of your data, you can use like, something like Pedersen commitment. So you put a number on the on blockchain, even you can put it on blockchain. But to read that number, you need uh, another one, which you take off chain. So that's like uh, something very interesting. So you can prove you, if you destroy, if you keep this key in the physical world and you destroy it, uh, you actually have a number of printed forever on the blockchain and no one knows uh, what's it. So, yeah. Uh, of the questioning of the grand jury uh, is up. Ladies and gentlemen, it's up to you to use your 10 minutes uh, for questions. And Ratra, again, is going to be with you. Um, yep. Same rules as before. Please state uh, your name and the organization that you come from and then put the question. I think, Ratra, you have uh, the first person to yep. put a question. Oh, hold on. Oh, yeah, I don't have to hold it, thanks. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Thomas. I'm with a Dutch insurance company in logistics. And I would like to elaborate a little bit more on the insurance already mentioned, because I think it also um, um, connects to the last question of the jury. Um, stolen goods is a big issue. It's a little bit different than counterfeiting, but there's a business case as well. Could you elaborate a little bit more? How could this be, could this solution be used to um, maybe prevent theft in the end? Would it be a solution or? Yeah. yeah so and then how would you, how would you um, implement it based on your solution? So uh, the, in the implementation, we want to find first uh, some uh, industry like luxury brands, an example, where uh, they really want to be sure only 100 of their products are done. And they really want to be sure that they, these products follow through the chain down to the consumer. And the consumer is, willing, is already willing to check that he's receiving the real one. For luxury brands, this is reasonable, right? For pharma pharmaceutical, also this is reasonable. So that is exactly the kind of uh, like pilot project we, we want to undertake. Uh, when the protocol is in place, it, when the, every party uses this protocol, if some party deviates, uh, it's, it's recognized. And it builds, uh, like, it, it's like the more he deviates, uh, the more he's building a bad reputation in the system, which uh, of course, this is, will be a new data available for the customs to easily see who is the bad actor or the logistical company to easily see do we want to accept the shipment or not before even having it. Maybe I see it's a shipment from someone with a very bad reputation. Maybe he's saying I have a couple of the virtual object, but maybe the shipment is made uh, mostly of an object without the virtual ID. So it, it's giving to the decision makers tools to take the right decisions. So 
that's uh, the, the protocol approach. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, again, ladies and gentlemen, you have the chance uh, to put a question, and the gentleman in the third row is approached by Ratke. Hi, my name is uh, Tim de Knecht, Port Rotterdam. Uh, my question is about the virtual twin and the, the status of the, the goods through the supply chain. Not all goods that are sent from a port of origin end up in the same state at the, the, the port of entry. How would you deal with that with the uh, with the virtual twin? Oh, sorry, I didn't get so the. So. so so maybe to elaborate. So if you transport cars from point A to point B, mm -hmm. not all cars make it in full mint condition. Mm -hmm. How would you kind of fix ah, that I issue? See. I see. So in the in the initial implementation of our protocol, we only check serial IDs. So yeah, that is definitely a problem because yeah, the serial ID is there, and maybe all the car is gone. So yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, um, as we were discussing before, there are other fingerprints that can be put inside the the virtual twin. Like uh, in most ex extreme scenarios, the tomographic scan, the or maybe some uh, print, uh, some 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 fingerprint based on the image. Uh, it can also be interesting to maybe uh, look at some, uh, you can do some tests, uh, like record the result of the test. So say you're shipping gold, you want to uh, put under the virtual twin, like the resistance to a it produced to a certain voltage. And you can, for every single uh, piece of gold, you can have its own very different, uh, you know, ohm resistance. So depending on the goods, there can be some very specific fingerprint data that you can store forever on the blockchain. Uh, and then you have to uh, like adopt some tolerance because if I like scratch a little bit the car, so maybe, uh, so yeah, this is, you know, it's a very complex problem and that, and that is why we want the, the community to be open source. So more experts can contribute from different angles. So, yeah. May I, Raka, ask a question? No, the lady in the second row first. Thank you. Uh, Hélène Nicola from the International Trademark Association. Uh, in the suggestion, in the solution you suggest, um, with the virtual copy, there's a lot of data that are processed. I was wondering, could there be a drift of using the data to trace and record the history of each consumer's purchase? Uh, so, can this protocol be used also in the secondary market? So, if I want to sell my thing on eBay and like look the chain on the secondary market. Uh, in theory, yes, you can do it. In practice, uh, we have some legal advisor that uh, <laughs> will answer to this question. Because <laughs> uh, so in theory, yes, you can you can use it also in the secondary market because you are creating this chain of ownership which is passing through addresses, and you can also see like if the consumer agrees to share uh, his data with someone, then someone can actually see. What, what is he buying? What what are uh, what's uh, her uh, her clothes? You know, what does he own? So there will be a lot of data which may or may not be the case to to publish. But I'm not a lawyer, so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Can I, as a non-expert, also put a question uh, to you? I hope um, I, I may. <laughs> yeah. um, from what point onwards? i.e. how many people do need to buy into your system in order to make it viable? Hmm. So, uh, uh, how many companies would you need to serve in order to make the system round? So I think we, the idea is to start with one and from a very small niche market, so which has very similar needs. But if one company uh, like big enough enforces this on all the chain, then for the second one, it will be easier because some entities involved in the distribution of the goods of the first uh, client then uh, will already be inside the system. So the bigger, the, the hardest step is the first one. The more you involve, the easier it is. So uh, we have to find the first one. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, we have three minutes. Hello, Oops. I am Emil from Unchain, uh, Pirate Busters. So my question is, what prevents the bad guys from like, setting up some sort of an exchange online where they can buy and mass a lot of uh, virtual tokens? So digital twins of real objects, which then can after be attached to fake goods. So for instance, if I buy a real thing, I have the digital twin, 
And let's say I keep the real thing, but I sell for cheap online the digital twin because I don't need it personally. Okay. So then it can be reassembled to another yeah. fake. So, so first of all, this, um, as usual, so if you are uh, uh, in, inside the supply chain, you will have all these red lines sooner or later co coming through you. If you are a, a private citizen which, for which the secondary market may or may not be um, may or may not be in place. So if it's in place, then you will have red lines coming through you the same way. So to enforce that the, the virtual queen is attached, uh, the virtual uh, token is attached to the correct uh, physical uh, object, uh, you use uh, negative incentives. So if you don't do it, sooner or later, uh, you know, all the arrows will, will point to you. Um, uh, then uh, if you say, uh, if you want to say this in an economical model, when you go to uh, when you go far away in the future, uh, the Nash equilibria is to adopt the protocol because if you don't, uh, you you waste the money because okay, you have uh, the real good, and someone else uh, is having the fake one. But uh, now they, for the system, they have the real one. So they have the warranties, they have the insurance, so they have whatever. So sure, you can be happy you have the real real one. But there are no more. It's like uh, it, it will actually. It, it, it can work only one, two times, and after a while, everyone will know that you are a bad actor. And on top of that, uh, you will not have access to all the services tied with the virtual uh, token. So, yeah. We have one minute to go. If there is a question, and Ratko is running now. Um, could you please make it short and snazzy? I will try to. Uh, Yellow van der Ploeg, also Unchained, Pirate Busters. It's a bit twofold. So in the logistics process, you have things that are packed in a box, in a box, in a container. So how do you do the handover if the identification is on a product level? And also, who's doing the analytics of all these red lines that you're talking about? And how are they looking into what the actual product is? Okay, that sounds yeah. like a half an hour explanation. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> so part of the protocol is this um, creating a shipment's ID computed on what's inside of the shipment. So uh, this allows you to do some uh, sample checks. So you can check two, three objects inside the shipment or inside the box or inside the box uh, and uh, match it with the shipment ID. And this already can give to you uh, red flags and green flags. Uh, to the question, of course, this is a new protocol and we require uh, integration with a new data source. So there will be existing systems which, which are already in place today, which will need to get data and sometimes push data to a, a, new, uh, a new network, which uh, is going to be you know, any blockchain which can interact with this protocol. We build it on Ethereum, um, can be done on Bitcoin, can, can be done on Hyperledger. Uh, maybe in 10 years there will be something better and that we, we will use something better. Thank you so much also for the yeah. short answer yeah. at this particular <laughs> Sorry for point. The, yeah. That was lovely. Thank you. Okay, thank you very and much. Uh, Cryptomize, uh, an applause uh, for the presentation <laughs> and for the grilling. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. much. You. And now I, we wish um, for the next 40 minutes um, good decision making, good talks. And uh, you are going to go away, think, exchange, and come up with a result, which we then will present. So thank you very much, Vinay Paolo and Charles, and of course, Christian. Big applause to you.